When we're talking about safety, first and foremost, safety is actually not completely defined in a regulatory way. What we do is we look for the absence of risk. So by determining safety, we actually do risk assessment. Risk assessment is a scientific process that is composed of two very important components. First is called hazard, and that is really the potential for an event or an ingredient to cause harm. And the second is exposure. And often people forget that second part of exposure, but it's critical. And, and we're talking about anything. If you're talking about the risk of having a car accident and the harm, obviously you're never going to have a risk of being hurt in a car accident if you never get in a car. <laughs> so. It's important that we look at both parts. So the first hazard is really where uh, toxicologists come into play. So there are very standardized methods and requirements for the hazard evaluation of food ingredients, including food additives. So the, one of the most important first questions that we ask is what happens to that ingredient when we consume it? In, in fancy terms, we call it toxicokinetics, pharmacokinetics, but it's basically where is it going and what does it do in the body? For uh, all food additives, we need to know not only toxicity in a short term, but critical is what is the effect on lifetime. So in order to really get an approval of any food ingredient, you have to know lifetime effects. It, it's potential you are going to eat food all your life and potentially be exposed to that ingredient all your life. So lifetime is the, the time frame that we are interested in. And of course, part of this is also specifically looking at any effects on DNA, genetic mutations, and cancer development. Also required is any effect on reproductive toxicity. So that includes impairment to get pregnant, any effects during pregnancy, any effect on the fetus, any effect on development, not only structural, but also developmentally, learning behaviors, and so on of the offspring. That is also required for food additives because unlike a medication, nobody says when you're going through the grocery checkout, are you pregnant? Is there a possibility you can be pregnant because you shouldn't have that product? No, it is required before it's approved that you know that you have to prove that ingredient is safe throughout uh, both development of pregnancy and, and pregnancy itself. For low calorie sweeteners, also now there is a requirement for human clinical studies, specifically for diabetics because this is a potentially susceptible population. We've heard already in the discussions about how potentially diabetics respond differently than healthy. That is understood. So also um, effect for specifically on, on blood sugar response and on insulin is also part of the safety evaluation for sugar replacements and high intensity sweeteners. All of these studies, and this is uh, not a small undertaking, when you are doing the safety evaluation for food ingredient, you're talking about eight to 10 years of research, and all of those studies must include dose response evaluation. So we're not really, we really wanna know how does the response change with increasing dose. The goal is to look at all of those studies in totality and determine what is the highest dose that can be fed to animals throughout their lifetime at, that will have no adverse effect. This is termed the no observed adverse effect level. I know it's not very creative, but that's how toxicologists are. So it is really determining not the toxic level, that is not what the regulatory basis is, or where we're having an adverse effect. We are talking about what is safe with no adverse effects for one's lifetime. To that number, we apply what are called safety factors. And these are usually 100-fold. They can be more depending on the uncertainty or the tests that are required or involved. But basically, it is to 
account for the differences that we've been talking about uh, in, in the previous sessions, the differences between individuals, that people vary, there's a great heterogeneity. The other is the potential difference between humans and animals. Now I have to say, as a toxicologist who's worked with many, many rats, some of the comments about rodents today were a little hurtful. <laughs> and that they are sort of only models and they don't really hypothesis generating. Well, toxicologists don't really see rats and mice that way. They are what we use as safety evaluation. One of the critical points is to evaluate how is that, that ingredient handled by the body and is it mimicked, is it exactly the same as in humans? So the uh, toxicokinetics will be done in the animal studies and in humans to ensure that animal is, uh, is a good and valid model for the human safety assessments. You think you have trouble recruiting people to eat cookies? Can you imagine if we wanted to try to do our safety testing on humans? It just wouldn't fly. So this is uh, a requirement and it's well established throughout the world that these, this is the appropriate method for safety assessment. So what we really have then is the no observed effect level from the most appropriate animal model based on the toxicokinetics and the longest study that we have, which would normally be a lifetime study, and then you divide it by the safety factors to get the acceptable daily intake. So this is what it would look like if you have the, uh, acceptable, the no observed effect level, it came out to be 1,000 milligrams per kilogram body weight per day. Your acceptable daily intake would then be set at 10 milligrams per kilogram body weight per day. So here you have basically that sort of safety cushion built in. The, the actual level that we would expect to see adverse effects are somewhere up on the second or third floor on this graph. So um, much higher than where we're starting. I think that is often a misunderstanding. People think that the acceptable daily intake is this magic number, a black and white dividing line between safe and unsafe, and it is not. It is the number that we have with great degree of certainty that if you are there or below that number, you have very low risk because you have very low exposure. That leads to the next part, exposure. So this is uh, calculated using food intake surveys, uh, and it is done by every regulatory agency that is going to approve that ingredient. And based on um, what is going to be the likely amounts put in different food categories, there will be maximum permissible levels set for various food categories. And the objective there is to ensure that there is not going to be anybody in the population who with their consumption of the food products containing that ingredient is going to exceed the acceptable daily intake. Did I do that? Right? Yes. So the intakes must be less than the acceptable daily intake or else if they, if after the exposure assessment numbers come out, it's higher, there will be an adjustment. Either the maximum permissible levels will be reduced or some of the food categories are going to be eliminated. And often what is hit here are the children's products because children tend to eat more of specific foods in relation to body weight. So often it is where people try to start putting these ingredients into food products where the maximum permissible levels have to come into play to ensure that all consumers, even at the highest uh, percentile levels are below the acceptable daily intake. For high intensity sweeteners, we are talking about actually very low intake. If you think about these, they are between 200 and 600 times as sweet as sugar. So you try taking your teaspoon of sugar and dividing it into 200 little bits and you'll see you actually take a very small amount of a sweetener in order to get an equivalent uh, sweetness of sugar. People don't really think of that they don't, because often the, what we're exposed to is the tabletop sweetener. You open up the little blue packet and you pour it out and you're saying, hey, there's quite a bit of powder in there. I can see quite a bit coming out. The thing is, for most of those, well, for all of them, only between 1 and 3% of it is actually the sweetener, the high intensity sweetener. Most of it is a carrier, a powder, and it varies, maltodextrin, it can, be, um, it can be dextrose or glucose, actually just so that for a consumer, they can see it coming out of the package and they can measure it. 
very difficult to measure one two hundredth of a teaspoon. So this is not true for commercial applications. What is actually added to the food product is the low calorie sweetener itself. It is only in the commercial tabletop sweeteners that you have these carriers and it really is just for ease of consumer use. But I think it, it contributes to misunderstanding about just how much people actually consume. In terms of how much do we actually eat then, and this is work done by IFIC, uh, recent evaluations for aspartame, and primarily this is US data, we eat approximately 6%, the estimated daily intake, 6% of the acceptable daily intake. And the acceptable daily intakes that I'm giving here are based on JECFA. They vary from country to country, so I didn't try to list I just gave the JECFA ones, which are the, the universal, globally accepted, acceptable daily intakes. For saccharin, the acceptable daily intake is up to five, and we consume about 12% of that. Of course, in North America, saccharin primarily is used only as a tabletop sweetener and not present in many food products. Sucralose uh, is higher in terms of the acceptable daily intake found mainly in baking goods um, be, and, and not so much in beverages. So now when you start looking at this graph again in terms of you're looking for the no observed effect level, this is specific for aspartame, and here is the acceptable daily intake in the US, it is, uh, it is 50. The actual highest user is 15 milligrams per kilogram body weight, and here is the average user. And average users are only people who consume low-calorie beverages. This is an average for the whole population. This is average of users only. So you can see now we're actually very, very low intakes compared even to the acceptable daily intake and to the no observed effect level. So what that means is there's very low risk. In other words, very high level of safety because of this very low level of exposure. So hopefully that was all pretty convincing, but you'll say, yeah, but that's not what everybody says, that's not what I read in the published literature, so, um, you know, really, what can you say about that? So, and I say that's really difficult. It is very difficult for people who are, uh, to even professionals, to try to get through all of this literature. I did a review of the safety of aspartame in 2007. At that time, there were 700 studies. I'm doing now one on sucralose and there's about 500. So it's, it's a huge amount of literature that is, is available on this information, uh, on these ingredients. How do we explain these different uh, opinions? So my point and what I'm going to kind of focus on now is you have to look really carefully at the study. And we've heard that a number of times in examples today about how changes in methodology and design, what is the proper controls, all affect the interpretation of the study. So obviously, is an appropriate study design? And I'm going to talk about some, ex give you an example of an inappropriate study design. Um, is it mechanistically logical based on what we know about that compound about the chemical structure, about how it is handled in the body, is it biologically plausible for there to be a mechanism of action? And of course, is it reproducible? Now, the other part that I hear very often is, I also want to know who funded it. I have a little, you know, issue with that being a strong criteria because I, I think often the, that criticism comes from industry-based studies. Well, if it's an industry one, they obviously have a bias and so on. And I'll tell you, um, I think that that's not a fair assumption because in terms of the industry studies that are submitted for regulatory approval, there's the very clear guidelines on the study design, on the reporting, and, and so on, which often maybe isn't well understood. So I'm not saying that there isn't some bias there, but I'm saying that there can be bias regardless of who is funding it. So I don't think that in itself can be um, a good guide mark that, okay, you just look at who funded it and either toss it or keep it. You have to look at the other factors. So this is the study that I want to talk about today, and particularly is one that was just came out, very controversial. 
in Nature uh, last year, artificial sweeteners induce glucose intolerance by altering the gut microbiota. And I'm primarily going to focus on the first study. Uh, it was a mouse study. There were actually six studies all reported in this paper. Um, and I'm going to talk about the first one, which looked at three different sweeteners, aspartame, saccharin, and sucralose. That was actually the only study that looked at more than one sweetener. All the remaining studies were conducted with saccharin. However, they then said that all of those studies conducted with saccharin were applicable to all artificially, artificial sweeteners. And I'm going to show you why I do not agree with that conclusion. Their final conclusion is that non-caloric sweeteners directly contribute to glucose intolerance, metabolic disease, and obesity. And, and I added in italics. Their hypothesis or their statement is that it's through these changes in the gut microbiota. So, be, and by the way, this study was financially supported and infrastructure support by the National Center for Personalized Medicine. So let's talk then about the fate of different low calorie sweeteners. Let's specifically talk about those three that are in that paper. So the first one is sucralose. Sucralose is, uh, the structure is the very same as sucrose, except three of the hydroxyl groups have been replaced with chloride. And so you have a trichlorodisaccharide. It enters uh, through the mouth, of course, and it completely goes straight through into the feces. So it is not absorbed, it is not metabolized, it is not digested, and it is excreted unchanged in the feces. So it's pretty much just straight through. Aspartame, completely different. Aspartame is a dipeptide with a methyl group, aspartic acid and phenylalanine and a methyl uh, attachment. It goes into the mouth and actually by the time it hit, when it hits the small intestine, it is completely digested. So there is zero amount of aspartame that is actually uh, absorbed intact. Zero amount gets to the large intestine. I'm going to go through this a little bit more in the next slide. And the third one is saccharin. Saccharin is a very small molecule. Actually, it is almost completely absorbed into the bloodstream, and uh, only about 5 to 8% goes into the large intestine. Because it is so completely absorbed, the primary route of excretion is urine. So you have three very different paths three very different molecules and three very different mechanisms or, or, or fates in the body. So again, just to kind of highlight, because aspartame, I think one of the most vilified uh, food additives, many people do not understand what actually happens to aspartame in the body. So I want to just uh, say it enters the small intestine. Uh, it is cleaved, uh, first of all, by the um, decarboxylases, which removes the methyl group. That methyl group forms methanol. That occurs whether you're removing methyl groups from pectin, whether you're removing it from any other food ingredient, such as caffeine, that has a methyl group attached. Those uh, carboxylases do that and produce methanol with every meal that you eat. So that is not unique to aspartame. It happens with all fruits and vegetables. Then that dipeptide is cleaved by peptidases, same as you cleave all of your proteins into the two individual amino acids. What is important is what actually enters the blood. Aspartame does not enter the blood. Aspart and we have looked at this, it has been looked at in every animal species using very uh, sensitive techniques. Aspartame is completely digested. The only thing entering the blood are methanol and the two digestive products. Uh, and these are, of course, found at much higher levels in, in various foods. And I basically just said all of that. The important point in terms of the paper on the gut microbiome is that aspartame never enters the large intestine. Neither does its digestive products completely absorbed prior to entering the large intestine. So in terms of, uh, oh my gosh, it says my time is up. <laughs> 
Okay, saccharin. I just said this. Uh, one thing uh, is that the high doses, I, I want to make a point that the effect of saccharin on the microflora, although published in Nature, was not really news. It actually was reported in the 80s, and there is a long list of studies that were uh, reported at that time, none of which were cited in the Nature paper. There's actually one very recently, even in June of 2014. Um, sucralose, the most important point here is that Many studies, because sucralose does go into the gut, there have been extensive studies looking at whether or not sucralose can be metabolized by the microflora, and the answer is no. Stevia glycosides, just because this is the only sweetener that actually enters the gut and is acted upon by the gut microflora, I've included it, it was not included in this study, but it actually does enter the gut. So just talking about these, uh, my, my take home is that it's misleading for a number of reasons. I'd be happy to send you the full evaluation here, but I'm just going to take a minute uh, to show you how then, given what I've just told you, how is it possible that they were able to find this evaluation? So the critical study was this one where they used an oral glucose tolerance test. And here you see these are the control groups that were water, sucrose, and glucose. These are the three sweetener groups. What they did in order to, uh, it was 11 weeks of exposure, and again, they're using this commercial formulation, 95% glucose in it. Uh, they then, uh, there's the doses, which I'm happy to show you, but extremely high. What they did was pool all these, instead of six groups of 20 animals, we now have two groups of 60 animals. That is how they were able to achieve a statistically significant effect. There is no uh, actually significant effect of any one individual uh, sweetener. In terms of they also did not in this experiment do any assessment on the gut microflora. So the only one that used all three had no effect on the gut microflora or no assessment. The critical point here is what did they not say? So here you see liquid and food intake. They only reported that for four out of the 20 mice per group. You absolutely cannot get away with that if you are doing an industry study for submission to the regulatory agencies. And in terms of food and water consumption, you'd think kind of important in a dietary study. They only did it for 72 hours out of the 11 weeks. So pretty much we have no idea really what, who ate what and how much. But what is shown here is in terms of this was delivered in the water, you see huge differences in consumption. This is the water control, how much mice usually drink. This is the uh, consumption with saccharin because mice really like saccharin. What they do is, uh, because they're having now so much saccharin containing glucose, no surprise, their food intake drops significantly. 50% reduction in food intake in the animals that fed saccharin. So given what we just heard in the last one, talk in terms of how different nutrients, fiber, and so on affect the gut microflora, it's really no surprise that you see a change in the gut microflora when you change rat chow, which has a lot of fiber, uh, or mouse chow by 50%. Also, surprisingly, uh, again, they don't even report, they weight, body weight, they only report 10 out of 20 animals. Now, nature paper, not that hard to measure mouse weight. Why you only do it out of 10 out of 20? So um, it, this is just an example of the so many problems in this paper where there's only smidgets of, of information given, only a tiny bit, you know, and you can't get the whole picture to really understand what's going on. This is in contrast, of course, to the human studies that have been done, and John's going to talk about these, uh, the human studies next, but in terms of the long-term studies that have been done looking at effect of all of these sweeteners in diabetic patients and consistently over and over, no effect. And again, uh, you know, I don't have time to talk about all of these, but I want to assure you this has been thoroughly evaluated. And none of this, um, none of the studies or none of the effects that were reported in that Nature paper have shown up in any of these studies. So in conclusion then, 
Uh, the safety of low calorie sweeteners has been extensively evaluated globally by many different international organizations and do include studies with diabetics because it's recognized that's a target group. Um, we keep hearing studies about sweeteners on a variety of things and it is critical that you look very carefully uh, because we can see so often that there are these major flaws in terms of study design and so on. And uh, just to say too, this is not, once it's approved, it's not a done deal. We just had a reevaluation of aspartame by EFSA in 2013. So it is uh, consistently reviewed over and over again. And with that, I'd like to thank you.